Hi everyone and welcome back to the YouTube channel. It is finally maple syrup and maple tree tapping time. You always know that because the temperatures get higher above freezing. It's really ideal in the upper 30s to mid 40s. You don't want to be tapping really late in the season in April when it gets above 40s and 50s because your sap will go sour. You get buddy sap so never tap too long. So this is a really late season for us to be beginning this year. In previous years, we have started the week of February 14th. I remember tapping two years ago on Valentine's Day. And to me, that is the sweetest gift for Mother Nature for Valentine's Day. So today, we are gonna be talking about some major don'ts to tapping your maple trees. There's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of misinformation about tapping a tree. And if you're a beginner, you're in the right spot today because I have been several seasons into doing this. I've got several generations ahead of me who have taught me the things that I know and I'm here to help you. The first thing we're gonna start with is what you're gonna collect your sap in. And this is very important. Every state has different rules and regulations for any containers being in contact with your maple sap and your finished maple syrup. But in my own personal backyard, whether it's for myself, my family, my friends, we are only gathering and collecting in food safe containers. Now let me talk about that for just a minute. On a plastic bucket, it is going to say food safe right on it. Now it should either be stamped on it in a permanent ink or on a sticker in some way. If you don't see that, just assume that it is not a food safe container and that you need to move on and find something else to collect in. Now that being said, old metal buckets a lot of times are showing positive tests for lead. Now if it has lead soldering in it, sometimes it's better to just retire that old equipment for doing maple sap and maple syrup and then it's just time to move on to plastic, other things that you can use. They look really neat, but you can use them for decoration, sell them, people are buying them on Etsy and making wall art with them. They're just beautiful. It's a nice thing to have around, but we've retired them here on our farm. I've also retired the old 7 16th taps or spiles. A lot of times people call them taps. Their actual name is called spile, S-P-I-L-E. Tapping is what you do to the tree. Spile is what you insert into the tree. So that is a huge beginner mistake. And just out of habit, everyone refers to them as taps. They're actually spiles. So if you've got the old 7 16 inch tree taps, you should retire those as well. There's another don't for you. A huge don't that we do on our farm I never buy disposable equipment. Everyone thinks it's cheaper, that it's faster or easier to just throw it away. We're very eco-conscious. We try to leave a small imprint, you know, on everything in our life. And we went with the uh, Sap Meister stainless steel taps for our first few years on the farm. And I have one of these here in my pocket that I can show you. This is 5 16 Sometimes they are also referred to as tree savers. Now this Sapmeister has a washer that is tack welded onto it. And if you pry too hard, you can pull that off. And then it's a much harder situation trying to get that out of a tree later on. They do make a rolled tap also. And now this is stainless steel. It is going to last and last. I have stainless steel milk tanks for collecting our sap in. There is no rust and this is a great way to go. I think these cost about $2 a piece when I bought them and of course you know with inflation they may be a little bit higher now and these only come in bags of 25 but this is a great way to go if you're doing it in your yard. So if you've got old equipment that is rusty just assume that it is lead or zinc. Better to be on the safe side than to have that affect your health, to affect your family's health and as well you don't want to inhibit any off flavors in your finished product. Now continuing on about some maple tap and spile information, 5 16 is the new industry standard. They also have a 3 16 inch tubing. Don't be confused. Most of the 3 16 inch tubing still requires a 5 16 inch hole drilled into the tree. 
Now one of the biggest things that I see all across YouTube when beginners are filming themselves in their homestead and their maple syruping, it doesn't matter if they've done it two years, four years, six years, the incredible heights at which people will tap a tree. If you are tapping a tree chest height and you have a bucket sitting on the ground, you're going to have to have about a four foot plastic tubing drop to get from the spile on the tree to the bucket. So just know that two to four feet high is sufficient enough. Any higher than that, then you're going to be spending extra money on tubing or drops. If you've pre-bought from anybody online any drops that are going down into a bucket, most of them are giving you two to three feet. And if you tap any higher and the snow melts, you're not gonna be able to reach your bucket. Another thing about buckets, with these plastic buckets, it's cheap enough and most stores will price match for you. And I have found in previous years, Menards, Lowe's, and Walmart all carry the same brand bucket. All of the ones that I have say Century Corporation on them, and they're all just about the same and they will price match them. I will tell you though that last year, the employees at Menards did not want to price match because the SKU was a different number for the buckets and Lowe's had no problem with it at all and they were happy to do it. And Lowe's was the original highest price out of all of them. But if you can get a price match plus the 11% sale at Menards, that's gonna be your biggest savings. So go ahead and get those bucket lids. That way you can have all of your buckets with lids on top of them. You can put a log or a rock on the top and it's not gonna blow away. A huge thing that I've seen done in so many videos across YouTube is people taking their bucket, putting in an extra nail or an extra hanger into the tree. Every hole you put in a tree is hardware that you're going to have to remove and that the tree is going to have to fight bacteria and heal itself. We have got maple tap holes in here from years and years ago and you can walk around a tree and realize how long that wound takes to heal. So don't go ahead and hang your bucket. Set it on the ground. You can just as easily find a rock. Even an extra log that you're going to use later on in cooking your maple syrup and put it on top of the bucket. So now let's move on to tapping your tree. Remember when you're putting the spile into the tree you are tapping. Don't hammer it hard in there because you can end up cracking where you've drilled in and all that precious sap that you're trying to get into the spile isn't going to make it up the spile. It's going to go underneath and have a drip, drip, drip all the way down the tree bark and you're not going to get much. And don't forget, drill slightly upwards. Don't get real aggressive about your incline on it, but it really helps to get it coming out so that no sap will go back into it and freeze because if you're waiting the next day for frozen taps to thaw you're also missing out on sap The important information to glean from here is one and a half to two inches depending on the bark of your tree. These old shaggy barked maple trees, real thick bark, all these fissures where they're real deep, real heavily grooved, you're going to want to go ahead and do two inches, maybe a little bit less depending on the tree. Now on a younger tree, I might go one and a half inch, even almost one and a half inch. As soon as I got that sap coming out, I want to stop. And always, always make sure that you are getting clean white pulp coming out with your shavings from your drill because if you're getting brown, that means you are getting dead wood, non-conductive wood that that sap is not flowing through. It is creating a scar inside of that tree, just like in your body, 
and that vascular system is no longer in play to deliver that sap out of the tap or out of the spile that you put into it if you missed and did the wrong spot. So on that note, if you have trees that you shouldn't be tapping, you're gonna have to figure that out. Most people who make maple sap do not call in an arborist to evaluate their woods and tell them what should be cut and what not. You're going to have to manage your maple wood, your maple trees, Throughout the years, you're going to have to make health cuts. You're going to want to promote new growth. You may even want to do future plantings to replace any older trees as they get too old to tap. Now this tree isn't in much worse shape than it was last year and I went ahead and tapped it thinking it was going to be the last year it was going to be here and it still gave me sap. It was notably less than in previous years, but it was definitely time to pull that tap. If you have a tree that's not giving you much sap during the process, you don't need to keep the tap in there and you can pull it out at any time and just let it start healing up early. Now, if a tree has a lot of damage, you know, from wind and ice, if it has a lot of heavy damage from the pileated woodpecker, I'll pull a tap out of that too. I did one of those out in the woods last year and, you know, two, three weeks into it, there wasn't much sap coming out of it. And we looked up and it had five or six huge holes we just decided to pull that tap. It was kind of off to the distance. There was no reason to try to collect that anymore. So if you have a section of a tree that has damage to it, if a lot of bark is coming off of it, just don't tap that section, maybe move on to another. Some people believe that if you tap underneath a large limb, that that's gonna be more beneficial to you, or if they tap only on the south side, that that may be more beneficial. I find anything on the east, south, or west side of the tree gives me ample sap. Now I have done it on the north side in certain cases in the woods and it really didn't make that much a difference. The sunlight and the heat from the canopy in the tree is what's really going to make the huge difference in your sap collecting and on which side of the tree. Okay so now you've got your buckets full of sap. What are you going to do now? Just let them overflow? No. On a good sap run, I might have to empty out my buckets twice a day. And that means in the snow, it means in the melted snow, in the mud, in the slush, and in standing water. Make sure you have yourself a good pair of rubber boots. I ordered a new pair last week and they came just in time. And I'll tell you, I ordered muck boots. They have been my go-to footwear for the farm and I wear them right out. My last pair, I even put rubber patches on them from the kids' bike tires just to try to get by for two weeks more while my next pair was coming and in shipment. So don't leave your sap out in the sun. Don't leave it out in buckets. It will work for emergency temporary storage. You're gonna want to store all of your sap in another food safe container. You can use food grade IBC totes. They work really great. They generally come in 275 to 325 gallons and I will tell you the 325 gallon totes are huge. Most pickups you can put two IBC totes in the back so keep that in mind if you're going or traveling any distance to go pick one up. You may be able to get a third tote if you leave your tailgate down and take straps, ratchet straps, so that you can tie them all down so that you don't lose your load. Because an unsecured load on any county road, any state road, you're gonna get a huge fine. For us, I was able to find some retired milk tanks from dairies that they were no longer making parts for, and I got great deals on them. If you can find them in your area, it's a great way to go, because again, it's stainless steel and it will last forever. If you can, look for stainless steel on the inside and outside because for some time they did do stainless steel tops, stainless steel inners, and a galvanized metal about three quarters of the way around. And that galvanized metal can go bad. I have a real ugly one from another video. It was the ugliest thing, but it was such a great deal. And I used it regularly last year with some caulking and sanding and painting. She looks a lot better than she ever did. So when we gather our sap, we do it as a family. Everybody goes out, everybody helps. Even little George, when he was a baby in a car seat, we put him on the trailer, pulled behind the tractor, and pop, pop, pop with that Johnny Popper. He just fell asleep and rocked in his seat, had him all bundled up, and took him out while we gathered sap.
the key thing in gathering sap, one is footwear, number two, waterproof gloves really will help you a lot because once your hands get wet, it can be miserable. Another key thing in gathering sap is to make sure you strain the sap. You don't want any bacteria, any tree branches, any bugs getting into your huge collection container. So we use an old milk strainer for that and it really helps a lot. Now you don't want your sap sitting around for too long, so make sure you get to cooking it within three to five days. If the weather is cold or you can put some ice from your buckets inside of it, frozen sap, that will really help store it a lot longer. And that's why I like the milk tank, it's insulated. It helps reflect a lot of the heat from the sun and keeps the sap cool on the inside. But once it gets cloudy, it's not even worth it. If it's smelling fermented or if it looks ropey and cloudy, don't cook it. Start from scratch, wash everything out because it's not worth all of the wood and all the time to cook up bitter sap. The last mistake that most beginners do, I will tell you, is over tapping a tree or tapping a tree that is too young. Here are the guidelines. One tap for a 12 inch tree, up to two taps in an 18 inch tree. And on very, very large tree, three or four is my limit. My big, big trees at the end of my driveway, I've done three and four of those so that I could get two on each side and it worked really well. But those trees are now going into retirement also. They are yard trees, but again, a lot of wind and storm damage. And if you're tapping trees in your yard that are for decoration, you may really want to cut back on the amount of taps to help prolong the life of your tree. Everyone says it doesn't damage the tree, it doesn't kill the tree, but if you over tap it, you're going to affect the vascular system and the overall length and time and the overall health of a tree. Remember, the more holes there are in a tree, the harder that tree has to fight bacteria that can enter those holes and the longer it's gonna take to heal those wounds. So thanks for watching everybody. I hope these tips helped you a lot. Stop by our Etsy store. We have maple drops on there if you need them. We're shipping them all out within one to two days so that everybody can get into their tree tapping. And then you can make your own backyard maple syrup. The link's over in the channel and down in the description. We'll see you next time, everybody. Don't forget to hit that like button for us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. You know, the first time I ever went and split wood, it was for maple syrup a couple years ago. I did enough to get me through that maple syrup day and as soon as it was over and I thought about it, I asked for that wood splitter for Christmas. Daddy just didn't split enough to get us through today. This is ash wood. That redwood cedar pine tree. It's heavy, isn't it? Yeah. It's a sucker. You're doing a good job. Keep at it.